next we have Tom Isaacson who will be talking about Camera Obscura. Okay, last talk, yay. Okay, um, yeah, 2020 was a, was a busy year. Um, obviously we had uh, the pandemic, but there was also a lot of uh, protests going on. Um, obviously the Black Lives Matter thing was very big, uh, Hong Kong democracy, climate change ongoing, uh, and then all the, you know, the, the crazy stuff, the Billy TK and, uh, and all of those kind of people complaining about all sorts of weird stuff. Um, but one of the things we really saw uh, a shift in was the use of social media and photos for tracking people, especially at the Black Lives Matter movements. Uh, I had stories about, um, you know, the FBI using photos of people, and even if they were wearing masks, using like tattoos and clothing they were wearing to track them down and, uh, and uh, follow up on that. So this, this is something that um, is definitely starting to become a much bigger thing. And then of course, new content. Uh, this year we had the Storm of the US Capitol, uh, possibly the worst use of OPSEC ever. Um, <laughs> we're, again, we're seeing um, a lot of use of uh, facial recognition on those, those selfies that people were posting, those videos to try and figure out who they were and, and track them down and them. Um, well, just track them down. They don't seem to be doing very much with them, but um, so yeah, it's interesting because this is kind of the other side of the thing. Um, a lot of these right-wing people are now saying, well, you complain when we did it to the Black Lives Matter processes, why are you complaining? Why aren't you complaining about this? So there's, there's that subtle difference between um, protesting against police, police brutality and um, trying to take down the government. One could possibly not equate those two things, but um, you know, it's a, it's a personal view. Um, so yeah, a lot of change in the last year or two. Um, we've also seen things like Clearview. Um, you've probably heard of this before, but if you haven't, basically Clearview is a company that went and scraped a whole bunch of public visual data from Facebook and Twitter and all of those kind of things, stuck it into a big facial recognition database, and then sold that service to various companies. And they, they actually got hacked, I think it was last year, uh, and somebody found out what their customer list was. Obviously there were some law enforcement people in there, but um, surprisingly there were quite a few uh, actually private companies like Macy's or Walmart. And you think, well why on earth are they needing to do facial recognition? It seems a bit weird. I'm not quite sure what they were doing with it. Um, but yeah, again, that's something. There are ongoing legal cases about this kind of stuff. Um, Twitter and Facebook are complaining that they shouldn't have scraped the data. Clearly you were saying, but it's publicly available, so we didn't really do anything wrong. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that one's gonna work out. Um, I put a link down there. There's, a, there's a quite a good um, episode of the Malicious Life podcast that talks about this, because the origin of the company, it turns out to be most of the investors are sort of white supremacists who wanted to use it for immigration checks, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not good. Um, interesting, I, I found this a couple of weeks ago. This is uh, an open website which kind of claims to do the same thing as Clearview, but you can go and try it for yourself. So you can <clears throat> basically upload your photo and it then tries to find your face in publicly available images. Um, they do claim that the, if you upload your photo, they only keep that for 48 hours. That's in their FAQ. Um, whether you believe them or not, that's up to you. A colleague of mine actually tried this out and said it was quite weird because all he got was a whole bunch of people that look weirdly like him, but not, <laughs> not actually him. So, um, but yeah, I, you can't, unless you actually go and pay Clever, you can't use their database, but this is a, a similar concept. Um, the other one I found quite recently was this exposing.ai website where if you put your Flickr ID into the website, it will tell you if any of the photos on your Flickr account have been used in any of these facial recognition databases. And this does seem to be an ongoing thing. A lot of these facial recognition databases, even though they're, they're, some of them are open source or just done by research by universities and stuff like that, they have actually used public data without actually asking permission. And again, it's kind of a legal gray area. You could argue that it's public data and therefore you don't need to, but a lot of people are saying ethically that's, that's kind of a, not a great argument. Um, So we are starting to see tech that come back against that kind of thing um, in no particular order. Signal have introduced a feature where basically you can turn on facial blur on the photos you pass on Signal. So um, it automatically removes those faces. Um, that's, I'm, I'm sure there are other apps that do this as well, but it's just the one I, I found while I was looking around. Um, 
VFrame is um, an open source implementation of a number of different tools. Um, they do things like, there's one for identifying um, munitions in photos and stuff like that, which I'm sure gets used by people like, I don't know, Bellingcat and stuff like that. But they also do one which will remove faces from photos. And the nice idea about this is it's open source, so you could potentially see this being used by other people in the future um, to be able to clean up photos before you post them online, those kind of things. Forks is an interesting one. The idea here is that um, you can poison or cloak, I think they say, the photo. So even though the photos look exactly the same to us, um, they say that they've introduced data into these photos that makes it difficult for facial recognition to work on them. Um, I did a, a lightning version of this talk last year at uh, Christchurch Con, and one of the other speakers, uh, Ben Lula, did a talk about Amazon recognition, which is their facial recognition um, engine, uh, Amazon's facial recognition engine, and how you can stop that working by wearing hats or fake noses or makeup or big scarves and those kind of things. Um, and after I did my talk, he actually tried out forks on a couple of the examples he used and it didn't make any difference at all. Um, so it may be that Forks was um, designed to work on a particular facial recognition technology and it doesn't work on the Amazon one. Um, it may be that they've improved it since it was first written, um, but it's certainly not something you should rely on. It does open up that possibility though of almost like an arms race between facial recognition technologies and um, these what do you call them, poisoning algorithms. Um, so when you post photos on social media, you poison them so they can't be used by facial recognition. And then the facial recognition arms have to go and try and clean that kind of stuff up. So we'll see. Um, but thanks for Ben for um, trying that out. This is probably my favorite one, the University of Maryland's Invisibility Cloak Project. You can actually go and buy this online. This is a lovely jumper. It reminds me sometimes of those jumpers you get given by elderly relatives for Christmas. Um, but basically the idea is that they printed this design on there that confuses facial recognition algorithms so they don't actually recognize that there's a face there because of the data around it. So you can see here this guy standing there wearing the, the cloak. Um, the system's picked up everyone around him but not him. And then in kind of in the opposite one, it's spotted that he's down on the ground there and pretty much everyone else on the photo has been excluded. Now it's not perfect, you can see the two guys on the right standing at a slight angle and that just seems to be enough to throw it off. So it's certainly not something you could rely on in, in every situation, but it, it's an interesting idea. Um, rather than just trying to wear a mask and things like that, you've got some sort of clothing that confuses the algorithm. So CCTV around the world, um, these are just some numbers I pulled, um, I'm actually not quite sure what date this, this represents, but it, it gives you a pretty good idea. It's something that tends to surprise, I think, a lot of people in America is that per capita, they have more surveillance cameras than any other country in the world. I think most of them would say it was probably, you know, China or someone like that. But no, um, China has more cameras, but they have more people, so it kind of works out. Um, but yeah, the use of cameras in society is becoming more and more prevalent. I think. London is possibly one of the cities with the most cameras per mile or whatever it is. Um, but um, yeah, this is something that, that seems to be ongoing. There's a, an interesting project, this Surfshark, I think is a VPN company, but they post this information and they do actually link to all of the sources for each country. So um, it's not completely um, unknown. Um, basically, you can see from the map from the color scheme, on the, the top there, red means in use, all the way to green, which just means not used at all. Um, New Zealand shows up as orange, which is um, approved but not in use. So technically it's, it's legal to use facial recognition here, but nobody's using it widely. Um, I'm sure there may be some individuals. So you can see, I mean, pretty much, I think the only green country I can see there is Morocco, um, but there's quite a lot of red, so this is, uh, Certainly countries are, are using this technology. You're starting to see bans on facial recognition. Um, I haven't done an exhaustive search here. Um, and these were the, the, the ones I found last year, so there may well be more ones um, that have been done more recently. 
They're not total bans. When it says San Francisco has done a ban on, a ban on facial recognition technologies, what they actually say there is city agencies. So effectively it means that any government, uh, any city agency within the city isn't allowed to use facial recognition. The problem is that some agencies within the city aren't beholden to the city, so it may be that the police are actually a state force rather than a city force or something like that. So it's a bit of a grey area, but you are starting to see more and more areas, so well, actually we don't, we don't want to do this, we're putting a ban on this. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how that kind of progresses as the use becomes more, more common. But the reason uh, that, that sort of kicked off this talk for me was last year when it came out that New Zealand police had actually started trying out a facial recognition system. Um, and they hadn't really told anyone. And their excuse was that they plugged it into the Auckland CCTV system that covers, already covers the city and they didn't need to ask permission because the CCTV system was already in place. So it was just an upgrade which is an interesting legal argument, and I'm not sure the one that holds up. Um, but the point was, because the data, the, the CCTV system was already there, they were just able to plug into it and use that data. And I very much doubt the people who put the CCTV system in, I don't know, it was 15 years ago, realized that what might be done with it or intended it to be used in that way. But that's where we are. And it really made me think about what you can do to actually design a system that's private so it can't then be used for those kind of things later on. And this concept of privacy by design, um, the, the phrase and the concept was actually published what, 11 years ago now by um, Anne Kavukin, who was the Privacy Commissioner in Canada. Um, and it has these seven points in. The one I really thought about was number three, privacy embedded into the design. The idea that you can actually design a system that you can't then come along later and extract data from because the data isn't there to extract. But I think um, <clears throat> privacy by design is something that I haven't really heard of it until I started researching this talk. I think this concept is gonna become a lot more common. Um, you, you see the growth of things like GDPR in Europe, some of the, um, the rules in, the, uh, talking about bringing it in Canada, uh, sorry, Canada, California, um, and other countries, I know Australia are considering this kind of legislation as well. I think this idea of designing privacy into the system so you can't accidentally or deliberately give out the data later on will become a, a much uh, stronger concept. So, the way you could potentially design a CCTV system is by using this relatively new concept of cameras at the edge, cameras that are capable of running machine learning themselves rather than what we've thought of previously is you feed it all up to a big server on Amazon's cloud or whatever it is and then all the data gets passed there. The idea that you can actually do this at the edge. There's a number of companies doing dedicated silicon for this. Obviously NVIDIA, uh, very well known. Um, Good luck trying to talk to them. They, they're, they're very good at working with sort of large car manufacturers doing self-driving cars, but um, unless you've got a multi-million dollar budget, you'll have trouble getting a phone call back. Um, I, I actually tried at my last job. Um, Intel, they've obviously been around for years. And then um, Umbrella are the other ones. They're actually uh, quite a small company, but they make dedicated camera hardware. So that's the only thing they do. Um, and the idea is that these, these CPUs, they have all the functionality you want from a camera system, so autofocus, white balancing, all of those kind of things. And then they also have some sort of ML engine that allows you to run locally those um, AI algorithms. There's been a few of these knocking around for years. The AWS Deep Lens camera was released maybe three or four years ago, I'm not quite sure. Um, obviously it's an Amazon thing. This isn't a production camera, this is just like a, a, a test camera that you can buy and play around with things. The idea is that you can rent your uh, AWS EC2 instances or whatever, run all your algorithms online to do your, your uh, training your algorithm, download it to the camera and then try things out um, in front of the camera. So it runs that part locally, but it was very much designed just to be able to try out AWS stuff. Um, you see quite a few things showing up on um, Kickstarter. This one um, was done by OpenCV, um, which is an open source library for um, 
facial recognition type things, um, vision type things. Um, again, very basic piece of kit, but it just allows you to run that kind of stuff on the hardware. Um, you get these really, really simple ones. This is literally a Raspberry Pi in a box connected to a camera. The software's running on the Raspberry Pi, so it's not really dedicated hardware. Um, but I mean, it has this amazing design aesthetic, so. Um, but it, it, it shows how simple this stuff can be. Um, you also may have heard of Tiny ML. Now, this isn't specifically cameras. This is just the idea of being able to run um, TensorFlow Lite on very small CPUs. So you might be using it for, say, uh, a voice-activated device or those kind of things. But they really are trying to make the amount of code and CPU required to do basic machine learning very, very small. Um, uh, a quick throw up for my employer, Technique. I work for a company called Technique. We actually use Amborella hardware, which I mentioned earlier, those dedicated things. We basically make these reference designs and then sell them to companies and help them to create products out of those. Um, so if you are interested in this kind of stuff, check the link or give me a shout. So, demo time. Um, I have this, this uh, Google DIY project. Um, you can. I don't think you can actually buy them online, but again, it is basically just a Raspberry Pi with a camera in a, in a little cardboard box. Now, I tried this out earlier and it decided not to work, so this may not function at all. Um, the key point here is that um, I don't have a Faraday caged hand, but this isn't connected to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or my phone or anything like that. It's all just running on this basic camera. This is just a battery. So the idea is, if it works, I hold it up in front of my face, hey, it worked. And it's just done a face recognition. It said, oh, I can see a face. So the button lights up. And then if I smile, it recognizes, or it, it's basically doing very simple um, emotion recognition. If I look grumpy, no, it's not doing it. It should turn red, but um, it's being a bit temperamental. But it, it just proves that concept that this is running very, very simple machine learning on just a battery back camera. Um, that's enough to recognize a face and then do some basic um, recognition of that face. And it, but it proves that concept of being able to do things at the edge. So what am I talking about? Well, when we've got the CCTV system, what do you actually want to do with the CCTV system? So imagine that your CCTV system is designed to do pedestrian traffic analysis. You want to know where people are in the city, where they're walking around, are there big crowds building up somewhere, those kind of things. So this is actually pretty simple to do with machine learning at the edge. You have a basic um, person recognition algorithm which recognizes the people on the street. And then this is the key piece. You don't feed back the video image, you just feed back the vectors for those people. You remove all of the other information from the stream. Firstly, it's a lot less bandwidth, which is great if you're just using you know, cameras connected to a 3G network. Um, and secondly, it removes that possibility of being able to abuse the video feed later on because you haven't got it. Great, problem solved. And you can do the same thing with vehicles, obviously. Um, it's just a different algorithm, but it's the same kind of concept. Um, I don't know what else you might want to do with CCTV, you know, pets. Um, but there's sort of very basic kind of functionality of looking at that video and feeding the information back. Now, I'm pretty much sure that if you try to introduce this concept, law enforcement would say, but what if we want to find somebody? What if there's an amber alert, child abduction, terrorist in incident, things that genuinely require us to find somebody quickly? Well, the interesting thing is you can kind of flip that on its head and say, we won't give you the video feed, but you can send the description of the face you're looking for to the cameras. And then if one of the cameras identifies that face, it just pops up and says, hey, this vector, that's the person you're looking for. And you can almost think of this in terms of a, an FBI top 10 list. You can't send thousands out to these cameras, so they just, they just wouldn't be able to handle it. But if you just had like the top 10 people you're looking for that day, then you can tell the cameras to look for those people and the cameras will flag them and tell you they're there. So you haven't broken that idea of not providing the video information, but you've allowed law enforcement some ability to track people. Um, and it's, it's really simple to do. All facial recognition systems work in similar ways. They basically have um, 
like a, a, an array of vectors that describe various things about people's faces. So for instance, the, the distance between your eyes, the distance between uh, the top of your nose and the bottom, these kind of facial characteristics that it doesn't matter which side of the face you're looking at or whether it's upside down, those characteristics will stay the same. And if you identify enough of them, they become relatively unique. So that's what you, you effectively send that, that little piece of information out to the camera. And it's relatively small. Now, the other point is, if you're trying to do CCTV across a city, you probably want to, make, to, to figure out where people are walking from one camera to the other. So it's easy. You just get the cameras to identify that face over there. It builds up that description of the face. And then it shares it with the other cameras and you can figure out where people are moving around the city. Again, you don't have to share the video data. The problem with that is, is that effectively you're sharing fingerprint information of that person. And in fact, there has been some research done on this where you can take that fingerprint information and turn it back into an image, and they're not totally unrecognizable. I mean, I'm not saying you're looking at that bottom one and go, that's definitely Elon Musk. But if you're trying to find Elon Musk and you see that face, you go, that might well be him. So you're, again, you're starting to leak that information again. So you probably, and I haven't done the research on this, but you probably need to have some sort of system of those cameras sharing, say, a private key so they can encrypt that data so the cameras share them, but anyone looking at the data across the network, they're not going to have any use for that information. Facial recognition has a lot of issues. Um, quite apart from the scraping of public data, um, you've got problems with crappy data sets like this one, um, especially to do with um, ethnic minorities, people of color, where the data sets don't really include those faces so they get misidentified. Um, and then God knows what law enforcement do with them, especially in the US. Um, there are other big problems. Um, there's a a female researcher works at Google on ethics of AI. Uh, I think it's uh, Timnit Gebru. I probably mispronounced that. But she was recently fired by Google for raising, issue, raising issues with their ethics of AI, which she was employed to do. So um, yeah, Google have a whole PR problem to figure out there. What's the point of having someone look at your ethics if you then fire them? Um, but there are a lot of these issues. But the problem is the media coverage of this stuff is really quite poor. There are different types of facial recognition, and at the moment, the media tend to treat them all the same. So you've got facial recognition like the Clearview stuff, which is I'm going to take a picture of your face, look it up in a big database, figure out who you are and where you live, and then use that information for my own purposes. That's the kind of the bad type of facial recognition. The more understandable uh, form of facial recognition is when you're, that, like the system with the CCTV, I don't know who those people are. What we're doing is we're seeing a face on the screen, creating a description of that face, and then tracking it as it moves around. And you can do that with facial recognition, um, ears, shape and size, um, clothing, gait. There's a number of different ways of doing this. Some systems combine more than one of them. But you're not actually identifying that person. You're just saying, here's a unique person, and then they're going to move around. Um, and a lot of the media coverage kind of gets those two conflated. So here's just two I grabbed earlier. In the UK, there's a supermarket called Co-op, and there was this article about facial recognition trial. Again, they weren't doing facial recognition. They were doing person tracking. All they were doing was watching people move around the supermarket, and then <coughs> um, potentially flagging them if they nick something, so the next time they came in, they could say, we don't want you in the shop. Again, the, this uh, screenshot is from uh, Woolworths in the Australia. They added this bit about the camera footage down the bottom here, and a lot of privacy concerns were raised about that. But again, they weren't doing facial recognition in terms of comparing you to a database. They were just seeing how you move around the shop. So what are you trying to do with this sort of shop tracking? You're basically trying to figure out, <clears throat> this is a unique individual. I may make a guess at their age, their gender, their emotion. I'm not actually trying to tag that information to that particular person. I just, you know what it's like from a marketing perspective. They want to say, okay, here's a person we identify as male, mid-40s, looks grumpy, 
they're probably looking for a lawnmower. You know, it's, it's just that generic marketing stuff they want to look at. So you're just looking at that, that age, that gender, and the mood. And then you pick up these weird things in the background. That's fake, by the way. But yeah, it, it's that, that very basic idea. Um, the list of previous offenders, you've seen this in shops for years. You go into shops sometimes and they have a couple of bad printouts on the, behind the shop, um, on the wall, of people who stole stuff previously. And it's just to remind the, 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 the checkout assistant there that if they see those people in the shop, they should you know, ring the manager. You're just kind of automating that process. And as far as I'm concerned, and this is my personal view, as long as you're not storing that data permanently, as long as the video feed and the tagging data gets disposed after, say, 48 hours, I don't have a major problem with this. I, privacy researchers may disagree with me, but I don't conflate this with the kind of facial recognition that something at Clearview is doing. There's also a lot of problems around um, home or doorbell cameras. Um, there was that really bad case last year where it turned out that one of the techs was installing the cameras, was adding himself to the security list on the system so he could then log in and watch people at home. Um, Amazon seemed to be doing a really good job of just making themselves the worst company in the room, um, where their security was really poor, so people were hacking into the cameras and being able to shout abuse or um, offensive comments to the children on the cameras and stuff like this. Um, Amazon have added end-to-end -end encryption as a answer for this, anyone who knows anything about end-to-end -end encryption knows it doesn't really fix anything at all because it really depends on the authentication you've got at either end of the encryption. And, and they've now said they're going to start sharing live video from those doorbells with some police departments. The idea is that the police can then just kind of check out all the doorbells in the area and see where someone they thought might be responsible for a crime um, might be wandering around the area. And this is actually quite a big problem. This is a graph, a, a map I found of all of the police and fire departments in the US who have some kind of participation in this Amazon data sharing scheme. <clears throat> Basically, the red ones are fire departments and the blue ones are police departments. Um, but again, this is kind of unregulated. You know, a lot of uh, people who own these doorbells haven't given permission to share this data. It's just Amazon sharing it with the local departments. So really, the end-to-end -end encryption, uh, encryption really doesn't help anything here. Another particularly bad one. This is actually came out this morning. Um, I just threw the picture in here. Cybergun is a reasonably well-known UK-based uh, security researcher. There's this thing called Nursery Cam. Um, go and read it up. It's just pathetic, the amount of security on this system. Basically, it's a camera in a nursery so parents can dial in and see what their kids are up to. There's no security on this whatsoever. And as you said, he's disclosed it because he didn't think he was going to get anything from the company. But there are big problems around these systems. Um, just very quickly, uh, so imagine if you were trying to design a door camera system, what do you actually want it to do? Well, you want it to be able to detect movement, obviously then figure out that that's not just you know a bird, it's, it's actually a person. Well, that's pretty easy to do with a machine learning algorithm uh, on the camera itself. Recognition of residents, family members, friends, you, you, you want to say, well, someone's come to the door, oh, it's my kids coming home from school, I don't need to be sent alert for that. So again, that basic facial recognition, you've just added five or six people to the system and it can figure out that those are known individuals. Package detection, a really good one. If you've got a courier coming to the room and they put a package down and then they walk away and you want the camera to go, well, there's a package there. Uh, I, I might you know, send you a message saying, hey, there's a package. Even more importantly, if there's a package there and somebody comes to the door and then the package is gone, you probably want to get alert for that one. Um, some of these doorbells have um, microphone speakers in them, so um, you can answer the door when you're not there. And then you might actually want to be able to log in and see the video feed. I, I kind of see that as a corner case, to be honest. But the thing is, you can design a system to do all of that using machine learning at the edge, some sort of encryption running between the camera and, say, the phones in your family, um, and, you, and maybe a back end just to send the notifications to, but you really don't need to stream the video to a cloud service. It's just nobody who's designing these cameras right now is attempting to do that, well, especially since it's Amazon and they have no interest in not using a cloud service. Um, I'll very quickly zip through this. Federated learning, I, bizarrely I found out about this because Google published a cartoon. Um, 
the basic concept is if you've got a system where you've put cameras out there and they're running machine learning on the edge and they're not sharing the video data with you, that's great from a privacy perspective. But if you actually want to improve the algorithm, you've got a bit of a problem because you don't have access to any of the video data. Federated learning is this basic concept of saying you can actually do machine learning at the edge very slowly. So effectively what you do is you get uh, the systems running at the edge to do training on their own and then they send that information, the training data, sorry, the trained networks back to a central repository. So you're not sharing the data, you're just sharing those improved algorithms. So again, you're maintaining that privacy aspect but you're still able to improve the software. Um, again, it's a very new concept um, and I think this one will um, also get a lot more common. Um, go read the comic, it's pretty weird, but um, <laughs> it does explain the concepts quite simply. They're waving the thing at me. I just want, quickly wanted to mention um, while I was looking through this, if you happen to be in Wellington in 10 days time, there is actually a discussion on this. Um, would be really interesting to attend, unfortunately I'm not going to be there. Um, Andrew, Dr. Andrew Chen, uh, some of you may have heard of him, commenting on the QR code, the scanning code, the COVID card mess they had recently. He actually did his PhD on this stuff. And it's actually quite an interesting read. It's, it's freely available online. Um, I mean, some of it, it was 2019, it's two years ago. It's totally out of date now. No, it isn't. I mean, the ethical stuff is, is absolutely not out of date. That'll never go out of date. But it's worth the read. Lastly, thank you very much to our sponsors. Um, last talk of the day, you're free to go. Um, but yes, without the sponsors, we, we wouldn't be able to do this. Don't go, don't go. Uh,